Next agenda item will be, uh, next two agenda items will be project updates. Um, <clears throat> we regularly try to uh, give council um, just regular routine reports uh, about uh, ongoing projects. And so um, this meeting, uh, we're going to present reports on the ENCODE project first and then microbiome research. So, please. Hey. Uh, thank you, Mark. Um, Happy to give an update on code project um, and uh, in doing so realize that a lot has happened since the last time that I reported to council. Uh, so um, just a reminder of why we're doing this project. Um, when we had the human genome sequence completed, we really were not sure how we could read the sequence. Um, I like to say that we had no instruction manual. There are no ready, readily available punctuation marks. Um, evolutionary conservation can help us to identify functionally important regions. There's at least 5% of the genome that's conserved, about 1.5% of the genome um, is protein coding. We really want to know what the function of the non-coding uh, non conserved sequences are and even what the function of the non-conserved sequences are. We know we're, we're moderately good at identifying protein coding regions, but the fine structure of uh, uh, um, fine structures of, of the uh, coding sequences are hard uh, to predict from the sequence. We know that regulatory regions can be very far away from genes, and we felt we needed an unbiased experimental investigation to uh, gather this information. So we launched the Encyclopedia of DNA Elements of the ENCODE project with the goal of compiling a comprehensive catalog of functional elements in the human genome as well as the genome of model organisms. We started this in 2003 with a pilot project focused on 1% of the human genome sequence. And then we scaled this uh, to a production phase in 2007, looking across the entire human genome uh, sequence. We, uh, in 2007, we also launched the Modern Code Project. Uh, these are production efforts to map the functional elements comprehensively in the genomes of C. elegans and Drosophila melanogaster. Uh, with uh, funds from, the, from our economic stimulus money in 2009, we uh, also funded a limited production effort in the mouse with the idea that we wanted to gather information that could help us annotate the human genome sequence. And then throughout this project, um, we have supported um, several rounds of technology development. Now, I reported um, about a year ago at last May um, Council the results of a mid-course review we did on the ENCODE and Mod ENCODE projects. And the purpose of this review was to assess progress towards meeting the Mod ENCODE and ENCODE um, consortia goals and to consider options for the future of these projects. I'm not going to go into the details of this review, um, except I wanted to say that um, the outcome was that there was recognition that these projects were in very high production mode and it would be uh, advantageous to con continue them for an additional year to take advantage of the high throughput um, production capabilities that had been generated um, and to really um, to uh, increase the amount of data that's being produced and also give an HDRI time to, to plan for the future. And so those projects were going to um, terminate this year. However, they're now going, they're extended for an di uh, additional year and we're, we're in the, in the uh, beginning of the, the fifth year of funding of those. So this is just a reminder of, um, I'm sure you can see, of, of the different functional elements that are being studied. Um, how do I do the pointer? Whoops. I'm going the wrong way. Okay, I see. There's a separate pointer here. So this is um, a figure from the marker paper uh, from the Modern Code project that was published in 2009, just outlining uh, the different functional elements that are being studied in Modern Code. These inc include transcription factor binding sites, histone um, in chromatin modifications, DNA replication sites, um, the uh, sites of, of transcription, uh, different pro uh, products from transcription, as well as fine-tuning the, um, the annotation of the genome. Uh, in addition, in, in the human uh, ENCODE project, we're mapping um, chromatin structure using uh, DNA's hypersensitivity mapping, um, as well as DNA methylation. So these projects were supported with the idea that they would be community resources, um, that we were hoping that we'd be used by the community to uh, further understand the uh, regulation of gene expression and to uh, hopefully be used to understand the genetic basis of disease. These are one of the hallmarks is a, a rapid pre-publication data release policy. And the analysis of this data has required the development of common data reporting formats, data standards, and analytical tools. 
So there are multiple ways to access the data. Um, the ENCODE data can be accessed by the uh, ENCODE portal, which is at um, ENCODEproject.org, hosted by um, UCS UCSC. They also, uh, you can also find the data at the UCSC genome browser at Ensemble and uh, through NCBI on their epigenomics page. The modern code data can be found at their uh, portal at moderncode.org, as well as um, the uh, Flybase and Wormbase, which hosts the um, fly and worm data, respectively. Mm -hmm. can, you, can you just give us some idea? I mean, so there are all these places when you, where you can access the data. Are we accessing the same views and the same data, or is each one got some value add or some differentiating factor? I'm going to let Peter answer that question. I think each one has a different value add. So if you look at the, um, the encodeproject.org and modencode.org, you're going to get the, 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 there are the data coordinating centers. You're going to get the raw data and the derived data. Um, and then you're going to be able to get tracks on the genome. You're going to be able to download all the data if you want to do large scale analyses. What you're looking at for Ensemble um, and Flybase and Wormbase is they sort of add value to this. Ensemble makes predictions about they, they have this sort of regulatory build framework that they layer onto Ensemble, which is sort of cell line or, or tissue specific. And then Flybase and Wormbase, they try to bring this in as they would any curated data. Um, so they layer it on top of the other data that's available. Um, um, and, and I, yeah. So. Okay. Thank you. Okay, so I'm now going to walk you through a little bit of specific information for the individual projects. This slide is a um, shows the data submissions from the Modern Code project over time, and you can see while there was a, a bit of a lag in the beginning, there's been quite a number, uh, quite a steep increase in the amount of data that has been submitted, um, and now uh, topping 2,000, um, two, two, I'm sorry, almost 2,000 data points, data submissions, I should say. Um, there's a lot of work that, that has taken place to actually analyze the data. As I mentioned, it's coming from a lot of different data types. And last year, um, the, uh, the Modern Code Consortia published uh, two major papers in science in December, uh, December, 10th, December 24th issue of, of science, including integrative analysis of the um, C. elegans data, as well as uh, integrated analysis of the Drosophila data. And along with that were 19 companion papers from individual groups published in Nature, Genome Research, including a, um, a Modern Code Special Issue, um, as well as Genome Biology and Database. So this was um, very exciting to see the, um, the fruits of all, all of this work in, in, um, in publication. As I mentioned, they, we've extended this project for a fifth year now. And uh, in this fifth year, we plan to have increased coordination of data generation both within the species and between the two, uh, the two species. And, and ongoing right now are plans for uh, a fly and more integrated data analysis. There'll be a data analysis working group uh, meeting this coming weekend in um, a building next door uh, in advance of the consortium meeting that, that uh, Eric mentioned. And this group hopes to take advantage of the additional fly and worm genome sequences that are, are now uh, available or, or soon will be available. Now, um, the um, modern community was uh, very excited at the, the recent Drosophila genetics meeting. Uh, they received a lot of very positive feedback from the community. And this uh, prompted them to do a community uh, survey of the use of the ENCODE data. And I don't have time to go into all the details here, and I can't actually see it all, but, but um, the first question is, you know, who is using the data? And most of the individuals are, are from um, well, I should say that over 650 individuals responded to the survey. Not everyone responded to all the questions, but it was quite, quite a large response. The majority of investigators are from North America, some from Western Europe, um, as well as from, from Asia. The majority of individuals uh, assigned them, uh, declared that they, they were basic researchers in model organisms or in, in genetics. Um, almost all the individuals work in, in academia. And 80% of the respondents uh, said they're either using the data, the modern code data, or plan to use it in the, in the future. Uh, the uh, different individuals who are using this, this data span from uh, PIs to postdocs and graduate students, as well as uh, educators shown here. And um, they're using the data either uh, 
several time several times a uh, a week uh, several times a month monthly or or uh, or weekly. I don't expect you to see all the details on this slide, but the, the, uh, what, one of the questions was what what data types are you actually using? And the top here shows the data for C. elegans, and you can see that there's a broad use of the different data types, uh, most being the uh, RNA and transcription factors, but some groups are, are even reporting using all the data types, and there are similar results for Drosophila. So this is very encouraging that there's wide use of all the different data types. And then the query was um, what um, what kinds of analyses were you were using these for, and um, <clears throat> well, the vast majority were for single gene studies or on, on classes of genes. There were also a number of genome-wide assays that that were um, genome-wide studies that were were being conducted. So this is very encouraging that the, the data is getting out and that the community is using the data. I want to briefly mention work on on the mouse and code data uh, that's been submitted. This project got started about a year and a half ago, and after some lag, there's been data submission pretty steadily, um, and now now topping uh, 100 data sets, and we expect there will be uh, a lot more of this coming, and we're looking forward to being able to use these data in, in the integrated analyses. Um, shifting over to the ENCODE data, um, there's a similar lag in, uh, in data submissions, but then a, quite a, a steep uh, set of submissions of the data. Um, almost at, at 2,000 data sets and, and, and showing no signs of, of stopping and, and quite quite a steep increase in, in the number of, of data submissions. Um, one way that ENCODE um, has found useful th thinking about the data is, is to think about the ENCODE dimensions. And there are three, three dimensions. One is to think about the different methods and the different factors such as transcription factors that are, that are being studied. Second is the number of cell types that are being studied. And the third is um, the dimension of across, across the genome. And so, uh, recent um, summary of the data shows that there are 164 assays that have been performed in ENCODE, including 114 different chip assays, and that uh, over 180 cell types have been interrogated across different um, different assays. And of course, we are are studying um, the uh, across the entire genome as most of these assays are using um, high-throughput sequencing methods to, to gather their data, so this is, this is fairly uh, agnostic across, across the genome. So in summary, there are, are over 3,000 experiments. Um, this has covered uh, five terabases of the genome, which represents over 1,700-fold uh, coverage of the human genome sequence, which is, is uh, quite remarkable. Now, as, as Eric mentioned, the ENCODE Consortium uh, published a, uh, recently a user's guide to ENCODE. Uh, this was published last month in PLOS Biology. Um, and this was in recognition of just sort of the vast amount of, of data that's being generated and the goal of trying to make this as useful to the community as possible. So the purpose of this user's guide was to explain to um, what data is currently available, what data can be expected, um, for the community can expect to see. Um, how to access the data, and has uh, several examples of, of using the data. Um, I think one, one is specifically looking at, at um, how the ENCODE data can help with interpreting GWAS SNPs, and I'm going to talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Um, the ENCODE community did, did not uh, do a user's uh, survey like modern code, but uh, we can just use a snapshot of, the, uh, of a recent Cold Spring Harbor meeting that, that Eric mentioned of the Genomes of Biology, where there are several um, plenary talks and poster presentations from ENCODE um, investigators. Um, but interestingly, there was 21 non-consortium abstracts using ENCODE data. So this is quite um, encouraging that the data is, is getting used by, by, uh, by the community. So for the plans for the fifth year are um, to have increased coordination of data generation. Um, there already is some, some coordination on common cell types, but we've ex expanded those. Um, there's heavy, uh, very serious work going on now on uh, integrated data analysis across the data types that we hope will lead to a publication this fall. Um, there, there was an analysis working group meeting in March that uh, sort of hammered out some of the details of this analysis, there, and there are weekly um, analysis calls. It's been a very intensive effort head up by, by Ewan Bernie and, and Ian Dunham. Uh, we hope to have an integrated analysis of the mouse and human data now that the mouse data is being submitted. 
and um, there are, are plans underway to discuss the possibility of analysis of all species. It, um, there's, a, as we mentioned, a consortium meeting coming up next week, and there will be a session uh, of joint um, analysis working groups for both ENCODE and modern code that will will uh, explore this possibility. So we're we're uh, we're not the only group that's that's doing generating this type of data. There's a Common Fund epigenomics project that you, I'm sure you're all aware of. This was funded in 2008 and included a big effort on what called the map, the reference epigenome mapping centers. Uh, any uh, NHGRI staff is working uh, has an ongoing coordination and communication with the NIH staff that are managing this project, um, as well as have communication with the mapping center participants. And this, uh, in many cases, is easier than you might think because many of them are the same individuals, um, which is fortunate for, for us, I think. Uh, we plan to have a joint meeting uh, next week to discuss ways to further synergize. We're, we're actually having back-to-back -back consortium meetings, um, so this will be uh, a, a short session in, in between those two meetings. And we want to discuss several um, uh, topics, including opportunities for directed data generation to have what we call complete data sets, opportunities for integrated data analysis, and Really, I think very, most importantly, maximizing, how, figuring out ways that we can maximize accessibility and the utility of the data to the research community. I just want to close with uh, some exciting recent results on uh, the intersection between GWAS hits and, and ENCODE. And it, it turns out that uh, about at least half, if not more, of the uh, GWAS SNPs that are in the NHGRI catalog developed by um, the Office of Population Genomics, they've fallen within regulatory regions either mapped by either DNA hypersensitive sites or transcription factors. And um, this, the data on this slide is actually is from John Stamatoyanopoulos, who is a, um, a PI both in the ENCODE and the epigenomics group, and this summarizes um, some of his results with, um, with both projects' data. So it's on, I think it's close to 100 um, cell lines. And what he's found is that, um, what he's showing here is that uh, the GWAS SNPs are mapping very closely to, uh, to DNA's hypersensitive sites. And uh, found that, that over 53% of the GWAS uh, SNPs are falling right within, um, within DNA's hypersensitive sites. And if you if you uh, look more critically at, at the GWAS SNPs and looking at externally replicated one, that, that ones, that actually increases to 63%. Then if you consider the SNPs that are in um, complete LD with the DNA hypersensitive sites, it looks like 75% of the SNPs are actually mapping in DNA hypersensitive sites. These are uh, the GWAS SNPs. Um, some other uh, interesting features that is that um, the disease or trait associated SNPs, the GWAS SNPs, are localized in pathologically relevant cell types. For example, um, SNPs associated with inflammatory bowel disease are mapping in T cell DNA hypersensitive sites. Um, many of these uh, SNPs mapping in, in DNA hypersensitive sites alter allelic chromatin states, indicating that they are functional. And the GWAS SNPs are localizing a physiologically relevant transcription factor binding sites. An example is shown on, on this slide. This is from a paper that was published uh, just recently um, by the, uh, the Bernstein Group with uh, reporting on his, some of his ENCODE analysis. And they mapped nine different chromatin marks in nine different nine cell types. And in, in looking at the combinations of where these uh, chromatin marks um, mapped, they were able to actually uh, identify 15 different chromatin states that are associated with different functions, such as promoters, enhancers, um, repressors, and, and inactive uh, uh, regions, as well, as well as transcribed regions. And they found, interestingly, that, that this, this landscape of, these, of the chromatin states actually differed significantly in the different cell types. And they also found that some GWAS SNPs mapped in, in uh, enhancers that are uh, active in relevant uh, tissues. So an example is shown on this, this slide, um, looking at SNPs, a subset of the SNPs that map in erythroid phenotype. They're, the SNPs are listed here. They are mapped against um, the, the different chromatin states that are shown in the different colors. In this slide, this is across the, the nine different cell types. And if you look at the second one here, K562, which is an erythroleukemia cell line, um, these orange boxes indicate, uh, orange and yellow in, indicate strong enhancers. And so these SNPs are, are all mapping uh, in uh, enhancers in K562 cells. And then if you focus in on this one SNP in red, it turns out that that maps about less than 100 base pairs from a, uh, an enhancer in K562. And the nucleotide change in this SNP actually increases um, 
the, uh, the consensus, consensus towards a, a transcription factor binding site, GFI1B, it, it enhances, it, it strengthens the binding site um, of, of, that, um, of that transcription factor. Uh, and that this transcription factor is a putative repressor in K562 cells. So clearly this is a very intriguing finding that is warranting, uh, warranting follow-up. So uh, in terms of the implications for this for ENCODE, when we look at the correlations between functional elements identified by ENCODE and the GWAS um, uh, SNPs, they, we feel they can lead to testable hypotheses for how disease-associated genotypes can lead to disease phenotypes. And it appears that the power to eliminate disease-related variation is related to the depth and the quality of the data, and clearly more cell types will allow coverage across um, more disease and trait phenotypes. So we feel that ENCODE is positioned to have a significant impact on interpreting genomic information associated with human disease. Um, now I just want to make brief mention of all the participants. Uh, there are over 200 participants in ENCODE and Mod ENCODE, where, uh, most of whom are coming next week um, to our consortium meeting. This slide lists the uh, nine different uh, PIs associated with, um, with the project um, and uh, with all, all of their, their co-PIs. The groups that um, are, are in asterisks are, are also Mod ENCODE PIs. It also includes two other groups. I'm sorry, mouse and code, thank you. Mouse and code groups, uh, including Ross Harrison, our council member here. Um, and there are addi several additional participants, uh, including Eric Green, who uh, was involved until he became the NHGRI director. Uh, in codes, uh, modern code, similar, has a large number of PIs. These are, are uh, there are 12 PIs associated with the project, uh, as well as numerous code PIs. And for in both ENCODE and modern code, and mouse and code, there are many additional uh, scientists, graduate students, postdocs, bioinformaticians, data, data analyzers, et cetera, who are, are participating in this group and have uh, really worked well together as, in a consortium to uh, really make, make the, the sum uh, much more than, than uh, the whole, much more than the sum of the parts. Just then want to end with um, acknowledging the other, uh, my other colleagues, Peter Good, Michael Pazin, Division Director Mark Geyer, all um, helped tremendously on this project, as well as to stellar program analysts, Rebecca Loudon and Leslie Adams. Happy to answer any questions. Mike. So uh, you said that 53% of GWAS hits fall within DNA's hypersensitive sites? And I was just curious, what fraction of the genome is DNA's hypersensitive sites? Oh, I, I think I knew that number. Do you remember that number? It's uh, it's, pretty, it's high. pretty high. Okay, so it's a multifold increase. Mm -hmm. yeah, okay. right. it, the numbers are around 10 to 20 percent, and and John presents today that it is statistically significant this increase. And and I should also say that um, uh, it's just been fortuitous that that G, that GWAS SNPs seem to be enriched for encode regions just because of the, of the way the assays were developed and the uh, requirement for certain GC content. Um, and what makes a good probe also happen to be a lot of the same features as the uh, regulatory sequences. So, but it biased in, in the direction that's to our advantage. Uh, if, if I could expand a little bit on that, the, uh, uh, the uh, this is now wearing my cap as part of uh, you and Bernie's group on the analysis working group in, <laughs> in ENCODE, but we, we recognize that uh, uh, characterizing this uh, uh, this phenomenon as, as clearly as possible is really key. I mean, I, I actually see this as one of the major driving uh, uh, goals for the, for the ENCODE project, and um, happily, whether you use uh, uh, John's work on the DNA sensitivity, Brad and Manolis Kellis on the, the histone modifications, you see substantial enrichment. Now, uh, the, there is this ascertainment bias, so you, uh, uh, if you uh, just look at the uh, genotyping microarrays, uh, they're also enriched <laughs> for, the, uh, for these functional categories that we get from the um, ENCODE data, but we're, we're also working to try to integrate everything that we know, the, the factor binding sites and, and uh, 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 the, the uh, DNA sensitivity and so forth, and, and working through that. But, but we uh, just very recently, it's, it's become quite clear, now, now that we're using as our null model the uh, uh, 
that that distribution of, of the genotyping steps, we still have a, a quite a significant enrichment in several of these functional categories. Also, um, and more, because the other real point is, is anybody using it? Are they finding anything that that, that really is uh, uh, helping them? And and I'm starting to see uh, multiple papers coming out where people have uh, 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 GWAS hits in non-coding regions, and they start with the ENCODE data, formulate the hypotheses, and go back and do the same kind of uh, uh, functional assays in uh, the, the uh, relevant uh, uh, pathological and physiologically relevant tissues. So I, I think it's really, really exciting.